This is a Shaw Electronics AAAS32171 TDA7492 based Class D amplifier. Uh, this is marketed as a bit of a upper market, higher end uh, amplifier because it goes for 40 to 50 dollars uh, out of China. Uh, it is uh, one of the few. Uh, class D amps on the market to have an encoder push button uh, for volume control as well as a headphone output. On the back it has a power output for 12 to 20 volts so it's designed to run off a 19 volt laptop AC adapter and it's got two inputs auxiliary and a couple of RCA jacks as well as some rather nice proper banana jacks for speaker outputs. So let's see how this thing performs. On the outside it certainly is not a bad looking amplifier compared to the normal standard from China. If you compare it to something like the Lapai LP2020 it's a proper work of art. But uh, generally with these you don't buy them for the looks, you buy them for the performance. But uh, before we get into that let's just take it apart, have a quick look inside to gauge what the quality is like. So to get inside you need to undo the four screws on the front as well as the four screws on the back as well as the nut around the volume control encoder. Uh, once that's done you can just pick the front panel off and pull the entire machine out of the back side of the case, plugs and all. On the inside we can see we've got a small aluminium heatsink on the underside which uh, is not at all connected to the outside of a case which makes the aluminium ridging on there purely cosmetic in nature. Uh, the speaker plugs are quite creatively connected with a Molex connector like you'd find in an old PC and they can be disconnected with considerable ease. Uh, just around the Molex connector we've got the four chokes for the two channels as well as uh, four electrolytic filter capacitors. Uh, they are of course no name uh, cheapo Chinese caps, their brand being uh, LH Nova which is a common brand to be seen in Shore Electronics products. So uh, for what it's worth this one is a genuine Shore Electronics judging from that. A nice feature on the board is that we have a big common mode rejection choke. Uh, this is connected on the input and it's going to serve to filter out a lot of the noise you would get out of your power supply and the noise that you would get out of the amplifier feeding back into the long antenna power lead going into it. So that is a very nice touch. Uh, it is going to make this a bit more EMC compliant than most of the really cheap amps. I don't mind that at all. We've even got a bit of an extra serious choke after that feeding into the big capacitors on the board. Not bad at all. If we have a look at the other side of the unit we can see that we also have polarity protection on the board. It seems to be a couple of series diodes on the input which is a nice touch. It means you are not going to destroy this thing if you connect your AC adapter up the wrong way around and that is not a given on these cheap China amps. We've also got two chips aside from the amplifier IC under the heatsink. The big one being a PT2033-S volume control source selector chip and the other one being a small PIC microcontroller which is clearly the brains of the operation. Since this has an encoder and a few LEDs which can fade in and fade out it obviously needs a bit of a brain to do that. Between the rotary encoder and the headphone output we've also got what seems to be a programming socket for the PIC microcontroller which means that uh, the hacky among us could easily reprogram this thing if we so desired. I'm not sure if there's a code lock on the processor but uh, uh, for the limited amount of features uh, present in the volume control chip, uh, reprogramming this thing would not be a big deal at all. So props to Shaw Electronics for catering to the hobbyists. I don't mind that at all, especially since, uh, as we're going to see in a moment, the software in this thing is perhaps not of the highest quality. If we have a look on the underside of the heatsink, uh, we can see that they've installed a fair amount of uh, cooling paste. The chip uh, is going to be decently connected to the cooling plate, so uh, they get points for that. I've certainly seen a lot worse in these China apps, uh, so there's no real reason to doubt that uh, it's going to perform quite well. It's not going to overheat uh, 
purely from the thermal resistance to the heatsink, although I do think this thing uh, might have a bit of a thermal issue if you really push it very hard for very long amounts of time. However, it did not run into any kind of throttling or clipping issues while I was doing the power output testing, which did include pushing 4 ohm loads for quite a while as I was taking measurements. So, for general use, I don't think this is going to be as bad as some of the other Class D amps we've seen in the past, where they just more or less instantly overheat if you load them down with a 4 ohm load. So, in a nutshell, this amplifier seems to have some potential. It's it doesn't have any immediately obvious critical flaws in its design. So, uh, let's get it back together and uh, see how it sounds. Alright, and we've now got the amplifier all connected up and ready to go. So, you turn it on by pressing the volume knob, so let's see what it sounds like. And the answer is very loud, because that is one of the prominent software issues on this amplifier because I just turned the volume knob one step to the left and the volume decreased dramatically. In fact, it decreased to the minimum level the amplifier will go because that's what I had it set to before. Uh, indeed, this amplifier has an issue where every time you turn it on, it will be set to a relatively high volume level. It's uh, certainly closer to the maximum than the minimum. And uh, this can be a bit of an ear raping experience if you're using any kind of sensitive speakers or headphones. And uh, it is going to be such an experience every time you use the headphones because the same issue applies when connecting them up. The volume is now very loud in the headphones and when I disconnect them, we're back to the very high volume we were seeing before until we turn the volume control one step in either direction. And really that is a deal breaker to me, because I really do not fancy having an amplifier which every time I turn it on I have to adjust the volume in order for it not to be incredibly loud. This would be a major issue if you're using it at night or in a shared apartment or something like that. And the fact that the same issue applies to the headphones, Just listen to that, I'm holding it up to a mic. It's just unacceptable really, which is a bit of a shame. Because I generally like this amplifier otherwise. So, while the amplifier is uh, disqualified for those software issues, uh, it still could be of use to someone who's willing to write a new firmware for it. So I have gone ahead and done a rather complete performance report on it. So let's just go through the data for how well this thing performs uh, uh, audio-wise and uh, generally it's not that bad of a device. Compared to most other amplifiers of a similar class I've tested, uh, this one stands out, although it still isn't a very high performing amplifier by any means of a word. Uh, it does have a very good noise floor compared to uh, other devices of the class of minus 70.2 decibel volts. Uh, that is about 5 decibels better than you usually see most of the TPA3116 amplifiers. It sits at about uh, minus 65 or so. Uh, to counter that, the frequency response is absolutely awful with a span of 8.6 dB over the uh, audible range and that's mostly made up of a dip in the very low frequencies and a giant spike of almost 5 decibels uh, at uh, 10 kilohertz and below. So this is not a neutral amplifier by any means of a word, it colors the sound. It's uh, as if you've got the loudness switch turned on on an old uh, uh, home amplifier, it's just gonna give you way more d treble than uh, you would want. So that's, that is uh, still generally quite normal in these, uh, it, it has to do with how they design the 8-bit filter. It also has a very high distortion in the high frequency range with uh, about 5% of THD plus N over 10 kilohertz, which is uh, very poor and uh, while it might not be the most audible of distortion at uh, times, uh, I cannot condone that because these two results truly are awful. They are uh, not acceptable by any standards. 
but uh, that is the trade-off you do get with these cheap Chinese amplifiers because uh, you basically are not going to find a cheapo Chinese amplifier which performs very well in these two uh, cases, but this one is below average, I would say. Uh, again, uh, above, uh, above average uh, is the out of band noise, that is the AC signal from the switching of the Class D amplifier. Uh, it's an inaudible noise which generally isn't an issue, uh, but sometimes it can damage your tra your tweeters if it's very high. But we've just got five millivolts at 352 kilohertz, which is an absolutely fine result. Uh, the signal to noise ratio comes out at 92.7 decibels, which is uh, acceptable. It's good by my automatic criteria here in the chart, but compared to a proper class AB amplifier, it's not very good. Uh, surprisingly, the gain is only 20 decibels. Uh, that means that you need a relatively high input signal in order to get a relatively high output signal. Which is a bit of an issue because I notice this thing does not like high input signals at all. In fact, uh, the input side might clip uh, at the normal output level of a PC sound card. So it's a bit finicky. Uh, this is not an amplifier really made for playing loud, it seems. It's more for desktop use. Uh, damping factor 46, absolutely acceptable, fine for one, one of these class amplifiers poor by hi-fi standards, but it's fine, it's not going to cause huge amount of distortion. Efficiency, about 85%, uh, absolutely fine. And uh, the maximum output power at 19 volts is 15 watts uh, into 8 ohms uh, before it clips, and 22.8 watts uh, while it's clipping very hard. And these are a pretty good figures. A high 0.3% uh, output level uh, means that you have a low voltage drop design, which uh, can be a signal that uh, you're dealing with a well-designed amplifier. Uh, this one performs very middle of the road. It's just fine, nothing special. And the same goes for the four ohm tests, where we can achieve about 22.6 watts of output power without clipping and using a standard 19 volt AC adapter. So, in summary, uh, this thing is a decently performing Class D amplifier with horrible software flaws, which I really can't recommend. I, I, I don't think it is at all acceptable to have an amplifier which doesn't remember the volume you've set it to. I, ge I generally, personally, have a preference for a potentiometer-controlled amplifiers. And uh, you, you can still apply one of these digital volume control chips with one with a potentiometer if you just uh, use the microcontroller to read an analog signal. So I really don't quite see why they'd choose to go the route they have because they obviously haven't quite thought it through. So that's about it. Uh, I cannot recommend this amplifier I, uh, unless you're a hobbyist who intends to uh, modify it yourself, write new software for it, or Shaw Electronics have come out with better software because this is several months old. It's, it might not be the newest revision. So yeah, you need to uh, keep an eye out, perhaps check some other reviews as well. Uh, but beyond that, uh, this entire sheet can be found and downloaded in the video description. Uh, you can get all the raw data I collected for it and uh, check it out for yourself if you're curious. So, that's about it. Thank you for watching. Cheerio.